Attending my wife's office party had its ups and downs. On one hand, I relished the opportunity to unleash the power of my challenger on the open road, yet the faster I sped, the sooner I'd reach the destination I dreaded. The event was slated at the company lodge, accessible via a serene 20-mile stretch of road, free from the interruptions of stop signs or traffic lights. It was just me and the Dodge, racing towards the gathering, albeit with no pit stops in sight. Candy and I had been growing apart ever since our daughters tied the knot. I had hoped for our bond to strengthen, but alas, it seemed destined to fray. Despite my reluctance, Candy insisted I accompany her this time, though she had previously attended such functions solo. Unlike her, I wasn't much of a drinker or a social butterfly. Over the past year, suspicions of her infidelity had lingered in my mind, yet I found myself indifferent. Perhaps this indifference was a symptom of our drifting relationship, as I quietly sought an exit strategy from this unhappy marriage, a means to sever the ties of a fading affair. I must confess, I likely played a role in my wife's decision to seek a different path. I've always been a bit of an oddity, a peculiar sort of minimalist. Growing up in a financially challenged family meant my siblings, and I lacked the typical childhood extravagances like bikes, toys, or fancy gadgets. It was akin to an Amish lifestyle without the religious doctrine. While I grasped the workings of the conventional world, I couldn't quite conform to its norms. I prioritized avoiding debt, paying bills promptly, and squirreling away savings for the future. Living comfortably as a minimalist doesn't demand fanaticism, but it does necessitate restraint. A few indulgences here and there help maintain an appearance of normalcy to the outside world. For me, the greatest indulgence was my marriage and family. Finding a partner who could tolerate my quirks and accept my idiosyncrasies was no small feat. Candy, with a background similar to mine, was accustomed to a frugal lifestyle. While not as enthusiastic about it as I was, she managed to tolerate it. However, over time, she seemed to gravitate towards normalcy, becoming less frugal and more conventional, particularly after our daughters came along. To avoid standing out as peculiar, we opted for a modest, sensible home and upgraded our attire. Candy even began indulging in occasional hairstyling and makeup, honing her grooming skills. We acquired two smartphones, models from the previous year, to fit in with societal expectations. As our daughters matured, Candy decided to enter the workforce, securing a minimum wage office job. Since transportation was essential, we acquired a compact Honda Civic for her, mirroring my own vehicle. Her earnings barely covered the car expenses, lunches, and the new wardrobe demands. It balanced out, and I found contentment in that. My name is Michael Johnson, a moniker as ordinary as they come. I diligently serve as a parts puller at a local company specializing in industrial compressors. Though the work is monotonous, I derive satisfaction from it. Despite being offered promotions, I declined without informing Candy, content with my current position and salary. A clandestine indulgence of mine was prudent retirement planning. Whenever possible, I discreetly purchased one-ounce crucerins, amassing over 30 of them in my basement safe with plans to continue. My final indulgence was a 1970 Dodge Challenger left to me by my late brother, Travis, who tragically perished while working on an offshore oil platform. Though I managed its upkeep alone, the insurance premiums were exorbitant. Candy flourished at Gilbert Industrial, receiving regular raises and promotions. Initially, she shared details about her job enthusiastically, but gradually, her discussions about work dwindled. I sensed something amiss but couldn't pinpoint it. Tonight, I hope to gain insight into the situation. The company gathering resembled a retreat, spanning a weekend. I felt distinctly out of place, begrudgingly attending. Despite having crossed paths with all of her associates at some point, I harbored no fondness for any of them. Exiting the interstate at Holbrook, I seized the opportunity to unleash the power of the challenger. Predictably, she responded with vigor. Candy, however, seemed uneasy with the speed, though she refrained from voicing her discomfort. Yes, I did push past the speed limit. No, I wasn't bothered by it. Mike, what's the rush? We have ample time. Maybe ease off the throttle a bit, Candy urged. I'm not in a rush to arrive. 
You know I didn't want to go in the first place. I'm just giving the engine a proper workout. It needs it every now and then, I explained. Please don't dampen the mood. This weekend is crucial for my career. Mrs. Griffin emphasized your presence is vital too, she insisted. Lois Griffin, spouse of the company's president, Oscar Griffin, hailed from a lineage of old money and business traditions. Why? I pressed. What do you mean? She countered. Why is my attendance crucial at this event? I failed to grasp it, I reiterated. Mike, it's important for you to understand the dynamics of my new role in the company, so you can support me effectively, she clarified. I'm still not following, I confessed. My new position comes with unique challenges. Lois suggested you be gradually exposed to them, so you can fully comprehend and support me. It might be overwhelming at first, but she's confident you'll grasp it eventually, she explained. I've always had your back. What's different now? I inquired. My new role demands more from both of us. Lois believes gradual exposure will help you navigate it alongside me, she reasoned. As we pulled up to the lodge, my heart raced with anticipation. Candy's unspoken message was crystal clear. It was going to be an intriguing weekend. Upon arrival, Candy swiftly made her way into the lodge, leaving me to handle the luggage. I couldn't shake the feeling of being put in my place. Hey there, Mr. Johnson. Sweet wheels you got. Is that a 70 or 71? Wally Bailey, the company's jack-of-all-trades, greeted me. Hi, Wally. 70, I replied. Wally then introduced me to his wife, Margaret. They were seated on the front porch, seemingly avoiding the crowd indoors. Scanning the parking area, I counted roughly 16 cars and one weathered truck at the far end. Our conversation veered towards the Challenger for the next few minutes. Why are you two out here? Shouldn't you be inside with everyone else? I inquired. Not our scene, Mr. Johnson. We were hoping to make an early exit, but Mrs. Griffin insisted we stick around. We came up early today to lend a hand with the setup. Caterers packed up about an hour ago, Wally explained cryptically. Care to elaborate? What's going on? I pressed. Something's off, but I can't quite put my finger on it. Hate to say it, but I reckon it's got something to do with your wife, Wally whispered. Planning on staying the whole weekend? I asked. Nah, that's why I parked my truck on the side. Easy exit strategy, he replied, adding another layer of intrigue to the unfolding mystery. Well, I better haul these bags up to our room. Give me a heads up before you leave, all right, I requested. Sure thing, Mr. Johnson, and watch your back. Don't do anything rash, Wally warned. Thankfully, it was only a couple of small bags to carry. Inside the lodge, Mrs. Griffin greeted me with a smile and a wave. Candy, visibly impatient, waited at the top of the stairs. Finally, Mike, we've got a few hours before the evening event. Freshen up and put on something nice. Tonight's going to be special, and I want everything perfect, she instructed. I think I'll take a stroll around the property to unwind for a bit, if that's all right. I'll be back in time, I proposed. As I exited the room, I couldn't help but notice a smirk playing on Candy's lips. The intrigue was escalating with each passing moment. The crisp air added a pleasant touch to my stroll. As I counted the cars, my estimate matched up. 16 vehicles, predominantly Mercedes with a sprinkle of Jaguars and a lone Lexus. Four of them boasted out-of-state plates. It puzzled me how my wife, in her current position, could seamlessly integrate with such affluent circles. We were clearly out of our league, and a nagging sense of unease settled in. Observing Wally and Margaret loading their bags into the truck, I approached for a chat. Looks like Mrs. Griffin gave you the green light to leave, I remarked. Not exactly. We're making our exit under the radar, Wally replied. I'm feeling a bit uneasy here, Mr. Johnson. Wally suggested we stay, but I convinced him otherwise, Margaret chimed in. I'd appreciate it if you could stick around until after the evening buffet. I'm feeling a bit apprehensive myself, and your company would be reassuring. Two heads are better than one, right, Margaret? I attempted a feeble joke, earning a bashful smile from her. I think we can manage that. Besides, there's crab and oysters on that buffet line, Wally added, hinting at his culinary preferences. I had a feeling I was going to enjoy Wally's company.
I complied with my wife's insistence on dressing up for the occasion. Just before we reached the buffet, our hostess linked her arm with mine and guided me to a secluded alcove. We're delighted you decided to join us tonight to support Candy. This marks a significant milestone in her career, and your unwavering support is crucial. The salary and benefits package she's receiving are quite substantial, and I'm certain you'll be pleased, Mrs. Griffin explained warmly. Pardon my curiosity, but what exactly is the position we're discussing? Candy's been rather elusive whenever I inquire, brushing me off with promises of explanations tonight, I queried. No need to fret, Michael. I believe she simply wants to surprise you, Mrs. Griffin reassured. You haven't quite answered my question, I persisted. Well, there's no official title per se. You could say she's taking on the role of a personal assistant, Mrs. Griffin disclosed. I see. Well, the buffet looks tempting. Thank you for the clarification, Mrs. Griffin, I responded. Lois, please call me Lois, she insisted warmly. I proceeded to enjoy the spread for the next hour, while Candy busied herself mingling with the influential guests. This afforded Wally, Margaret, and myself some quality time together. As we were wrapping up, Mrs. Griffin approached. Michael, Candy mentioned you brought your sleek little car tonight. Would you mind making a quick booze run for us? She asked. I nodded with a smile. Of course, Lois, what do you need? There are three cases of wine waiting at the ABC store in Holbrook. They're already paid for, so it should be a straightforward pickup. If any issues arise, just give me a call. And don't forget your phone, she instructed. I'll let Candy know and head out right away, I assured her. As Mrs. Griffin walked away, I caught Wally's eye. Meet me outside in five, I whispered. Candy simply smiled when I informed her of Mrs. Griffin's request, offering a casual reminder don't forget your phone. It struck me as curious that both she and Mrs. Griffin emphasized the same detail. Wally, I need a favor, I said, tossing him the keys to the challenger. You serious? Wally's eyes lit up. Take it down to Holbrook and grab those three cases of wine from the ABC store for Mrs. Griffin. I've got a feeling there might be a hiccup that delays things if you catch my drift, I explained. Wally grinned knowingly and nodded in agreement. Here's my phone. Just leave it on the dash. If it rings, ignore it, and whatever you do, don't turn it off. Clear. I handed him my phone. How long should we be gone? Wally inquired. At least two hours, and make sure to fill up the gas tank before heading back to the lodge. Enjoy the drive, I replied. The evening air carried a slight chill but I was grateful for the comfortable jacket I'd thrown on. Now all that was left to do was wait and observe. From various vantage points on the back porch, I could catch glimpses of the lodge's interior. I wished I'd brought a thermos of coffee, but that level of foresight eluded me. Finding a cozy spot where I could observe without being spotted, I settled in. Candy seemed to command the center of attention, though I still couldn't discern the reason behind it. She appeared radiant, laughing and engaging with guests as if she were a Hollywood star. Twenty minutes later, I noticed Mrs. Griffin and Candy scrutinizing Candy's cell phone. It was clear what they were up to, checking my location. Meanwhile, thanks to Wally, I was well on my way to Holbrook. Their smiles and Mrs. Griffin's raised hand hinted at some form of approval from the room, though I couldn't quite make out the details of their conversation over the distance. It almost seemed as though there was a quiet, collective nod of agreement among the guests, a subtle form of applause. Oscar Griffin approached, clasping Candy's hand. Together, they ascended the main staircase, their hands raised in a victorious gesture, accompanied by laughter. The room erupted in cheers as they made their way up the stairs. With the challenger still about an hour and a half away, I resolved to make the most of my time. My trusty buck pocket knife, a cherished gift for my daughters a decade ago, was always at my side. Made of sturdy steel, it maintained a keen edge. Surveying my surroundings, I decided to start with the cars nearest to the lodge, taking care to work meticulously. There was no need to rush. Each valve stem was carefully removed and stowed away in my jacket pocket. Sixteen cars, sixty-four valve stems in total. With nearly an hour left, I pondered how to occupy myself. 
Four cars remained locked, but the others were accessible. Retrieving the registration slips proved an easy task, whether tucked into visors or stowed in glove compartments. Though unsure of their future use, I deemed them worth keeping. With 30 minutes remaining until Wally's return, I turned my attention to the spare tires. Since I had access to the cars, the trunks were open to me as well. Within 20 minutes, 10 more valve stems were added to my collection. Surprisingly, two cars lacked spare tires altogether. I'll admit, my actions were petty and immature, but they provided a small sense of satisfaction. I've never been one for confrontation, preferring instead to operate in the realm of subtle and underhanded tactics. I didn't feel the need to assert my masculinity or portray myself as a hero, let the alpha males take on that role. Twenty minutes later, the challenger returned with Wally and Margaret, both seemingly pleased with the excursion. As anticipated, there was indeed a delay at the ABC store, and it appeared to be pre-planned. Not a single call came through to my cell phone during their absence. I switched it off and removed the Siam card. They were eager to depart, and I bid them farewell, strongly advising Wally to seek alternative employment as soon as possible. I suspected the cases of wine in the truck were quite valuable. To avoid any accusations of theft, I promptly placed all three cases on the lodge's front porch. The journey home was tranquil. There wasn't much of importance left at the house, just a few personal documents, my laptop, and my crudurants. Initially, I had considered setting the house ablaze before departing, but I didn't want to martyrize Candy in any way. Within two hours, I was back on the road. There was no need for a farewell note or leaving behind my wedding ring. Let her puzzle it out on her own. With no particular destination in mind and no sense of urgency, I embarked on a two-day drive. By Monday morning, I made the decision to call into work and tender my resignation. I requested that my final paycheck be forwarded to my parents' house in Carlisle. Needless to say, my abrupt departure didn't sit well with my employer, but I offered no explanation beyond a simple apology. A reliable breakfast at Waffle House was always a comforting constant. While perusing a local merchandiser paper over my meal, I stumbled upon an intriguing help wanted ad for a nearby supermarket. They were seeking someone to stock shelves from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. After breakfast, I decided to check out the market, located in a quaint, older section of Chattanooga. Driving around the neighborhood for the next hour, I admired the charm of the older craftsman cottages and spotted a few mobile homes scattered about. While a small trailer could suffice, I was hopeful for something a bit more substantial. Fortuitously, I came across a sign advertising a garage apartment for rent. Though the garage wasn't included, I negotiated an additional $50 a month for access. The apartment itself was modest, a one-bedroom unit with a half-bath. Furnishings included a bed, dresser, table, and chairs. The rent was reasonable and the location ideal, so I decided to seize the opportunity. I could address the lack of a full bath later. At least I now had a home for the challenger. The job situation at the supermarket was unique. While they had plenty of applicants, they were hesitant to leave just anyone alone in the store overnight. I laid out my circumstances to the owner without sugarcoating anything. What sealed the deal was my willingness to work off the books, without benefits, and at a dollar less than their preferred rate. Surprisingly, they didn't even ask for my social security number. It was a win-win situation. I was happy, and they were satisfied. Plus, the supermarket was conveniently just a 10-minute walk from my new apartment. The remainder of the day was spent settling into my new abode. The landlord kindly provided me with the access code to his internet, which I appreciated. A brief visit to the local Goodwill yielded some kitchen essentials and a small microwave, along with linens and cleaning supplies. That evening, I made the decision to cancel my life insurance policies, though I opted to leave banking and credit card matters untouched. After all, what harm could she really do? With both of our daughters now married, my departure felt slightly less burdensome. Though we hadn't yet welcomed grandchildren, I suspected it wouldn't be too long. I reached out to my daughter, Batty, to reassure her of my well-being. While she knew I had left, Candy hadn't divulged any further details. Batty assured me she'd keep her sister, Alice, informed. 
Deleting all calls from my wife, I powered off my phone once more. Feeling the grime of the day, a shower sounded heavenly. Perhaps tomorrow would be the date for that. Not everything fell seamlessly into place. Securing a safe location for my gold became a priority. While the value of my stash may not have been substantial in the grand scheme, its significance to me was paramount. In a somewhat peculiar twist, I ended up securing a safety deposit box in Huntsville, Alabama, hoping to obscure any connection to Chattanooga. My hopes of remaining incognito were dashed when it became apparent that the two locations were indeed linked. Nevertheless, I found solace in the notion that I had made an effort. Despite the nearly two-hour drive, I didn't mind the trip. Though the garage door at the apartment provided some security, I took extra precautions by installing a new hasp and a heavy-duty lock. My cherished vehicle needed protection, after all. Adjusting to my new job was relatively swift. Initially, I had a colleague working alongside me for the first three nights, but soon found myself flying solo. Tasks in the produce and meat departments were minimal, but the frozen food section posed its challenges. However, after a couple of weeks, I had everything under control. To address my showering needs, I opted for a Planet Fitness membership, which set me back $20 initially and $10 a month thereafter. The downside? They required a credit card number. This necessitated another trip to Huntsville to obtain a credit card for my new bank. It was becoming apparent just how difficult it was to completely vanish off the grid. Clearly, some adjustments were in order. Uncertain of the lengths Candy might go to in her search for me, if at all, I resolved to cross that bridge when I came to it. Before long, I had my nightly routine down to a science. Clocking in at 10 p.m. and wrapping up at 6 a.m., I'd make the 20-minute jog or 30-minute stroll over to Planet Fitness. Initially, my membership was primarily for the shower facilities, but gradually, I found myself gravitating towards the other gym equipment. By the end of the first month, I was clocking nearly two hours of exercise daily. Not only did I feel physically better, but I also noticed a slight reduction in weight. While I never considered myself overweight, shedding some flab was a welcome bonus. It was comforting to slip back into a routine. I grew accustomed to my new job and found a sense of contentment in its monotony, oddly finding a certain charm in its repetitive nature. It's difficult to articulate, but perhaps you can grasp what I mean. I did my job efficiently, and in return, they granted me the space to work independently. Planet Fitness proved to be an excellent choice. Swiftly, I discerned which exercises I enjoyed and which ones I preferred to avoid. Heavyweights held no appeal for me, and as I jogged to the gym daily, the treadmills lost their allure. I kicked off each session with the Planet Fitness Circuit Workout, a brisk 30-minute routine. Following that, I dedicated 20 minutes to the C2 rowing machine, another 20 to the stair stepper, and concluded with the final 20 minutes on an upright bike. I never bothered with a TV, but I did invest in a used desktop computer with a decent-sized monitor. Most evenings, my entertainment revolved around watching YouTube videos. While I didn't spend much time cooking, I noticed my eating habits slowly evolving towards a quasi-KTO diet. Coupled with my unconventional working hours, I inadvertently found myself incorporating intermittent fasting into my routine. After three months, with an improved sense of well-being and some weight loss, I decided it was time to reconnect with my daughters. This time, I dialed Alice's number. Hi, Alice. It's your dad. Well, it's about time. We've all been worried about you. Are you alright? Yes, I'm doing great. Don't worry about me. I've always been able to take care of myself. I'm calling to check on how your mother is doing. Mom's doing fine. She got a raise at work and seems to be enjoying her job. But she's really angry with you. She said you abandoned her at her promotion celebration and left home like a wounded child. Those were her exact words. She thinks you're jealous of her success. Well, I'm sorry, but I can't add anything to that. Until she's ready to tell you the truth, that's all I have. She mentioned that things are a bit tight financially without your income, but with her raise, she thinks she can manage. I'm glad to hear she's doing well. Did she tell you anything about her new job? Just that she's making more money and traveling more. I fell silent. After a brief pause, Alice resumed, 
Will you be home for Christmas? I don't think so. I'll try to send something for you and Batty. We don't need or want anything, Dad. We'd rather have you here. Sorry about that. I have to go now. Tell Batty I said hello. Bye. I found myself in a bit of a funk. It seemed my daughters didn't quite grasp the complexity of the situation and placed the blame squarely on my shoulders. While I wasn't thrilled about being painted as the villain, I didn't feel obligated to justify myself. It became increasingly clear that there was no remorse on my wife's part, and I couldn't help but feel a twinge of bitterness. According to my daughter's account, Candy was thriving without me, which left me puzzled as to why she even wanted me back home. I drowned my sorrows with a case of black and tan over the weekend, noticing a gradual uptick in my beer consumption. However, as the weeks passed, things began to look up. I excelled at my job and received an unexpected raise. With free reign over my responsibilities, I swiftly streamlined and improved the stock replenishment system. My weekly reports proved invaluable to the company, guiding inventory levels and reordering intervals. While the store's computer system handled these tasks automatically, my manual input was appreciated. My living situation suited me perfectly and remained well within my budget. I shed some weight and started building muscle, even catching a glimpse of a six-pack in the right lighting. Opting to let my facial hair grow, I now sported a full head of hair long enough to tie back into a small ponytail. My entire demeanor seemed to have shifted, exuding a newfound sense of confidence and perhaps even a hint of intimidation. My gym sessions were becoming more manageable and stretching out a bit longer. Unexpectedly, I began forging a few acquaintances at the gym, though I was cautious, particularly around the female gym goers to avoid any potential impropriety. With the guys, it was all good-natured banter and teasing. We enjoyed poking fun at each other regularly. However, amidst this camaraderie, an unlikely connection emerged. Her name was Judy, or so everyone called her. Not particularly sociable, she rarely engaged in conversation with anyone except me. Each morning, she embarked on an intense workout regimen, eschewing the frills of a yoga-style routine. From what I gathered, she appeared to be in her mid-forties, tough-looking, always clad in sweatpants and a sweatshirt, a stark contrast to the other women flaunting their figures in tight, revealing attire. I endured my fair share of teasing for being the sole male she interacted with at the gym. While I didn't actively seek out her company, I also didn't rebuff her advances in any way. I'll admit, her attention did flatter me somewhat. Despite several months passing without contact with either my daughters or my wife, I couldn't bring myself to reach out. Instead, I diverted my attention to expanding my Krugerin collection with multiple trips to Huntsville. However, a shift in the wind was on the horizon. Michael, can I have a word with you? Judy's use of my full name caught me off guard. She was the only one who called me Michael instead of Mike. It was unusual, to say the least. Of course, Judy. What's on your mind? How can I assist you? There's something I need to discuss with you. We found a bench and settled in. I have a company event to attend on Friday evening, and I need an escort. I'll cover all expenses and provide transportation, since I've noticed you don't drive. If necessary, I can also reimburse you. I hesitated momentarily, and Judy sensed it immediately. Did I say something wrong? I apologize if I did. No, not at all. It's just that there are a few complications in my life, so to speak. If you can overlook them, I'd be glad to help. Okay, what are the issues? Firstly, I'm married. Oh, I see. You never mentioned a wife. I suppose that changes things. Not necessarily. I wanted to be upfront with you. I haven't seen or spoken to my wife in over nine months. I'm not even sure if we're still married. Have you filed for divorce or separation? No, I haven't. All right, what else? I don't have any appropriate attire. No suits, jackets, dress shirts, or formal shoes. I don't own any of that stuff because I don't have a use for it. That's not a problem. I can take care of that. That's why I'm asking a week in advance. I work nights, but I believe I can get the evening off without any issues. I'm glad to hear that. What else? Do you want me to shave or anything? 
Michael, I like your beard and your hair, but you do look a bit unkempt. Would you mind if my stylist gives you a once-over on Friday afternoon? A stylist? I groaned but nodded in agreement. And so began my association with Judy, professionally known as Judy Walker, attorney at law. On Tuesday, I found myself at Joe's A. Banks, a step up from my usual haunts thanks to Judy's prior arrangement. I walked out with two pairs of pants, two sport coats, a couple of shirts, a few ties, and even added two turtleneck shirts to the mix, something I've always fancied. Judy had taken care of the prepayment. On the way home, I swung by to grab a new pair of respectable shoes and some fresh underwear to accommodate my recent weight loss. Opting for moccasin-style shoes, I ensured they were still classy enough for the occasion. Come Friday, my visit to the stylist went smoothly. The stylist was amiable and skilled, leaving me with a neatly trimmed beard and transforming my ponytail into a short, modified mullet. I couldn't pinpoint the exact style, but it was longer in the back, and he assured me it would be easier to maintain. I found myself quite pleased with the result, though the stylist didn't say much about Judy except mentioning I was a lucky guy. Judy arrived punctually at 6, beeping from her Lexus outside my apartment, a stark contrast to the neighborhood. Opting for the gray jacket and matching turtleneck, I thought I looked rather dapper, though I lacked any real point of reference. I was grateful Judy was driving, as I wasn't familiar with the city's routes. Judy, before we head in, could you clarify what exactly my role is tonight? The initial hour will likely involve socializing. You don't have to dive into that scene. Most of the attendees will be pretentious snobs you'd rather avoid. Just stick close to me and keep the creeps at bay. Be subtle, but don't let anyone push you aside. Make sure I always have a drink in hand, whether it's ginger ale or mineral water. Stay pleasant and agreeable, and whatever happens, don't lose your cool. Essentially, you're my arm candy. Let them believe we're a couple. I've never thought of myself in that light. I don't have much experience with this sort of thing. Do you think you can handle it? Absolutely. Oh, is there any food? After about an hour, we'll be served a $500 plate of rubber chicken and sit through some speeches. After that, there will be more socializing. By the way, you look great. It dawned on me that I hadn't complimented her on her dress or hair. I truly felt out of my depth. The initial part of the evening unfolded just as Judy had described. Surprisingly, I found my role to be less daunting than expected. The room buzzed with single, well-dressed men flaunting their expensive suits and watches. Judy, looking stunning as ever, attracted a fair share of attention from these suitors, most of whom knew she was unattached. They approached her cautiously, testing the waters. Channeling my inner Charles Bronson, I gave them a stern look, which surprisingly deterred them. Every time I left Judy's side to refresh her drink, another opportunist swooped in. Some even brought her drinks, which she discreetly passed to me for disposal. Judy cast a few glances my way, her smile somewhat ambiguous. Finally, it was time to sit down. Suddenly, a parade of 300 chicken dinners appeared out of thin air. It was a dismal excuse for a meal. I'm not typically a picky eater, but this was subpar. With each bite, I couldn't shake the thought of the $500 price tag. Judy leaned in, whispering, Michael, want to ditch this joint? Attempting a Bogart accent, it fell flat. I didn't reply. Instead, I rose from my seat, took Judy's hand, and we slipped out quietly. I doubt anyone even noticed. As we reached the parking garage, Judy kicked off her shoes and tossed me the keys to the Lexus. Find us some real food, Michael, she said. Twenty minutes later, we found ourselves at Hillbilly Willie's, indulging in a full rack each accompanied by a long neck. Judy didn't shy away from the Tabasco, and we both disregarded the side of fries, opting for the eagerly welcomed bibs instead. Amidst our feast, I couldn't help but notice an oddity. Judy's evening gown boasted long sleeves, a rarity among the other women's attire, which predominantly featured short sleeves or none at all. Yet, she remained barefoot, seemingly unfazed by the unconventional choice. As we dined, things quickly returned to a comfortable normalcy. Though my evening with Judy was enjoyable, it lacked any hint of intimacy. 
Our dynamic at the gym remained unchanged, with friendly banter and mutual encouragement. Three weeks later, Juby enlisted my company once more for another function requiring an escort. I readily agreed, feeling compelled to explain the situation to my boss, who found it rather amusing. Understanding the circumstances, he assured me that seeking permission for time off was unnecessary. A simple note would suffice. Essentially, he left me to manage my own schedule responsibly. Judy's rigorous daily gym routine was evident. She maintained a high heart rate and perspired profusely, despite her fully clothed attire. While most female gym goers opted for sports bras and shorts, Judy preferred sweatshirts and long pants. Though it struck me as unusual, I decided not to broach the subject. Our second outing mirrored the first, minus the food, and with an increase in libations. With more drinks came a surge of unwelcome attention from eager suitors. Each new arrival seemed to bring another cocktail for Judy, keeping me occupied as I discreetly disposed of the unwanted beverages. However, one particularly persistent individual tested my patience. I pulled him aside and issued a quiet warning that if he made another advance toward my supposed fiancée, he'd face consequences. After that, he and many of the other unwelcome guests vanished for the remainder of the evening. I hadn't realized I could be so intimidating. Following the event, we opted for sushi, devouring a hefty $40 worth of sashimi. Despite the lack of romantic involvement, it was yet another enjoyable, platonic evening. Two days later, Juby caught me off guard during my rowing session. Why didn't you inform me that we were engaged? I felt a bit awkward yesterday when some of my colleagues asked about it. Without waiting for a response, she flashed a smile and continued with her workout. I decided to reach out to my daughter Batty for an update. She mentioned that Candy had been avoiding both her and Alice. All Batty knew was that Candy's schedule involved frequent travel and that visitors had become a regular occurrence at the house. When I inquired whether her mother had initiated divorce proceedings, Batty admitted she had no clue. It had been weeks since either of them had heard from Candy or Alice. I found myself consumed by anger for reasons I couldn't quite grasp. With each emptied bottle, my frustration only intensified. The following morning, fueled by my irritation, I visited the post office and shipped off 74 valves stems to Oscar Griffin at Gilbert Industries in a flat rate box. Alongside the stems, I included a brief note. Thanks for a memorable evening. Though more than a year had passed since the party, I was certain he would recall the incident. The hangover from my drinking binge led me to skip the gym that day. I couldn't bear the thought of working out with a pounding headache. The next day, Judy grilled me with questions about my actions, prompting me to promise her an explanation during our next dinner together. True to my word, she picked me up at six that evening, and we dined at Ruth's Chris Steakhouse, an upscale establishment unfamiliar to me. I made an effort to dress appropriately for the occasion. Throughout the meal, Juby listened attentively, refraining from passing judgment. I returned to my apartment in time for my work shift, feeling grateful for her understanding. At the gym the following day, Judy inquired whether I knew any of the individuals present at the lodge on the night of the party. When I mentioned that I had the names and addresses of everyone in attendance, she seemed intrigued. After our workout, she stopped by my apartment, where I handed her an envelope containing 12 car registrations. Gratefully, she kissed me on the cheek before departing. Judy worked as a personal injury lawyer, a fact she tried to explain to me without much success. Instead, I teased her about the potential cost of her assistance. In response, she simply planted another kiss on my cheek, leaving me with more questions than answers. Three days later, I received a call from my daughter Alice. She informed me that Candy had reached out to her, desperate to locate me. It seemed that Candy was embroiled in some kind of workplace crisis and urgently needed to speak with me. Alice, however, remained tight-lipped about my whereabouts. I couldn't help but wonder if Oscar had received those valve stems. Immediately, I dialed Judy and informed her that I would be picking her up in 20 minutes. Her office was situated in an upscale strip mall, not too ostentatious, but undoubtedly classy. Judy had never laid eyes on the challenger before. The topic of my car ownership had never come up in conversation. As she stepped out of her office, the rumble of the engine drew curious stares from her colleagues. 
I greeted her with a smile as she approached the car, and we exchanged amused glances at the attention. Well played, Michael. Well played. Judy chuckled as she settled into the passenger seat. Perhaps you'll be wanting an engagement ring next? I teased as we pulled away from the curb. In due time. Let's not rush things, she replied with a grin. I maintained a steady pace until we crossed the Tennessee River, at which point I decided to let loose a bit. Route 72 leading into Huntsville provided a scenic drive, though not ideal for showcasing the Challenger's capabilities. Within two hours, we found ourselves seated at Dreamland, ready to enjoy a hearty meal. Michael, everyone who was at the lodge that night has been served legal papers today. What do you mean served? It's a lawsuit. Technically, it's termed as malicious conduct contributing to the deterioration of a marriage. Is that even a real thing? It seems so. They've met all the criteria. Their behavior was deliberate, extreme, and caused you significant emotional harm. Maybe that's why my wife seemed upset. By then, our plates were stacked with succulent ribs from Dreamland, and conversation tapered off. Judy finished her last rib and looked up. Why was your wife upset? My daughter Alice called earlier. Candy needed to speak with me urgently about a work issue she's caught up in. I'm in the dark about the details. Oscar Griffin and Gilbert Industries are being sued for $1 million. The others are facing suits of $100,000 each. I hate to sound cynical, but do you think that'll really pan out? It might not be straightforward, but I have a feeling some interesting developments will unfold. I eyed another long neck but refrained, mindful of the drive home. Judy, on the other hand, indulged in her lager, relishing the moment. Feeling a tad adventurous as we exited the restaurant, I casually proposed to Judy if she'd like to stay the night and head back in the morning. I'd love to, but I can't, she responded. We could leave early, I suggested. That's not the issue. Let's just head back now. I'll fill you in on the way. The first 20 minutes of the drive were silent, but then Judy began to share. Eight years ago, she weighed close to 300 pounds and chose diet and exercise over bypass surgery. Remarkably, she shed 140 pounds but was left with 20 pounds of loose skin. It took five surgeries to remove it, leaving her with scars all over her body. Despite being a bold and outspoken woman, she admitted feeling self-conscious about her scars, avoiding dating and male company. For some inexplicable reason, she felt comfortable with me, though she couldn't pinpoint why. I dropped her off at her house, walked her to the door, and planted a small kiss on her cheek. She thanked me for the meal, a tear glistening in her eye as I left. Our platonic dating continued, and both of us seemed content with it. Nick and Jack markets were thriving, having expanded to two additional stores within two years and seeking more. When they offered me a full-time position as inventory manager for all three units, I accepted, despite the condition that I become a regular hire, requiring me to go fully legal. At that point, legality didn't seem to matter much, and Judy was pleased, which made me happy. Several more weeks passed without hearing from my daughters until I received a short text message on my phone. Mom got fired. That added a layer of complexity to the situation. Now that I had a regular job with a decent salary while Candy was no longer employed, I worried about getting the short end of the stick in a potential divorce. But then things took a turn for the worse. Michael, I have some good news for a change, Judy said, her tone serious, capturing my full attention. What is it? I asked eagerly. Three of the eleven people we sued have settled, she explained. What does that mean for us? I inquired. Since we were seeking only $100,000 in damages, their insurance companies advised them to settle to avoid public litigation. It's covered by their insurance, so it's not a significant personal loss for them, Judy clarified. So, does that mean we might actually get some money out of this? I asked, hopeful. Yes, Michael, I've already received three checks, and there might be more coming, Judy confirmed. Do you think this might have influenced Candy getting fired? I pondered. I'm fairly certain it did, Judy replied. Will this affect my divorce proceedings? I questioned. Have you filed yet? 
she probed. No, not yet. I was actually going to ask you to help me with it, I admitted. Judy's face broke into a wide smile. Michael, pack a small bag and get the challenger ready. We're taking a road trip to see your wife. We'll leave early Thursday morning. Now, I couldn't help but smile too. We departed at 6 a.m. and checked into the Sheridan 10 hours later. The challenger hummed contentedly. I called Alice and arranged for Candy and Batty to join us for lunch at the Reading Motor Inn the next day. The atmosphere during supper was a tad awkward. We indulged in selecting dishes off the Red Lobster menu, enjoying ourselves perhaps a bit more than planned, but considering it a celebratory occasion. Our conversation meandered through various topics, both of us carefully skirting around the elephant in the room. This was our first night together after over a year of being friends without benefits. The last thing I wanted was to make Judy feel uncomfortable. While I'll spare you the intricate details of the evening, I can confirm it wasn't nearly as daunting as we had imagined. Both of us felt a bit rusty, but managed to navigate through it with the expected outcome. Judy appeared relieved that I didn't find her off-putting, and I was glad it wasn't as awkward as she had feared. We were two happy fools, sharing a late breakfast together the next morning. As we arrived at the table, Candy and the girls were already waiting. I was dressed in one of my new sports coats paired with a dark turtleneck, feeling rather sharp. Judy opted for a lighter business suit, projecting a casual yet professional air. The looks of amazement on my wife's and daughter's faces were hard to miss. Candy, Alice, Batty, meet Judy Walker, my attorney and confident, I introduced, feeling the weight of the situation. Before any small talk could commence, the waiter approached to take drink orders. I'm not hungry. Just coffee, please. Candy spoke up first, setting the tone for the rest of us. I'll have the same. I concurred after a quick scan around the table, confirmed the unanimous decision. It's good to see you again, Mike. Care to catch us up on what you've been doing? Candy's words dripped with a hint of sarcasm, and Judy nudged me under the table. Just working, giving you the space you needed, I replied with Judy's support evident. You abandoned me when I needed you, Candy retorted. You needed someone, but it wasn't me, I countered. Mom, Dad, enough. Why are we here? Alice intervened firmly. I realized this meeting wouldn't last long. Feeling lost, I looked to Judy for guidance, but she remained silent, taking charge of the conversation. Judy reached into her purse and handed an envelope to Candy. Mrs. Johnson, this is a divorce petition. It's fair. I suggest you have your attorney review it, she said calmly, initiating the next step in this difficult process. Batty and Alice wore expressions of astonishment, clearly caught off guard by the unexpected turn of events. But Candy, she had a smug grin plastered on her face. Instead of accepting the envelope from Judy, she retrieved a similar one from her purse under the table. You idiot. I divorced your sorry behind eight months ago for desertion. Candy spat out, her grin turning into a smirk. You never got a copy because I didn't know where to send it. It's final. Whatever you've got here is worthless. And trust me, there's nothing you have that I want. The waiter arrived with our coffee and an urn just as Candy stood up. Flashing a smile at Judy and me and giving the girls an odd look, she left both envelopes on the table. Dad, can we stay for lunch? I've heard they have great quitch here, Batty suggested, breaking the awkward silence. Judy and I chuckled, agreeing as we asked the waiter for menus. Over lunch, Judy, Batty, and Alice engaged in lively conversation while I felt like I was dining alone. Women had always been a mystery to me. Before long, the girls exchanged phone numbers, promising to stay in touch. Back at the hotel, I began packing. Michael, I thought we were staying another night, Judy remarked. We are, but not here. Hurry up and pack, I replied. An hour and a half later, we were in Elton, Maryland. Thirty minutes after that, Judy Walker became Judy Johnson. We spent the night in Luray, Virginia. I wanted to keep driving, but we didn't make it. We found a house with a three-car garage, but that's a story for another time. The girls later told me that Candy had a meltdown upon learning that I received two million dollars from Gilbert Industries. She ended up moving to Yoa. Go figure.
Thank you for watching this video to the end. If you liked it, please like it and subscribe to the channel. See you soon.